Well, today we're coming towards the end of our series on David. You'll remember we spent several weeks talking about the stories of David in the Old Testament. And more recently, we've been looking at some of the psalms that he wrote, the worship songs that are collected, 150 of them in the Old Testament. And today we're looking at one of the better known ones. It's Psalm 40, which you might know from the U2 song uh, 40. Uh, I'm going to read you uh, the opening section of it. David writes, I waited patiently for the Lord to help me. And he turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire. And he set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along. He's given me a new song to sing, a song of praise to our God. And many will see what he has done and be amazed and they will put their trust in the Lord. Now those are the first three verses. And if you just go by those, or if you just go by uh, U2's song, then it looks like it's just a straightforward psalm of praise. But the truth is actually rather more complex. If you look at the structure of the psalm, you find at the beginning, the first five verses uh, are along the lines of what I've just read in here. Everything is going well. And then in the middle, David has an insight that we'll return to later. But at the end, from verses 11 through to the end, uh, David is once again crying out to God and saying, save me because I'm in such a terrible situation. And we'll look more closely at that. So the question I want to ask is this. Why does David need saving again at the end of the psalm? If God has already rescued him, if the whole thing begins with him saying that God has lifted me out of this pit, why at the end does, does he find himself in need of saving again? Now, you'd expect the psalm to be laid out the other way around, wouldn't you? You'd expect the first part to be saying all the things that are wrong and crying out to God and then arriving at the end at a place of saying, well, God has rescued me and lifted me out of my pit. But that's not the way this works. Now, I want to suggest that the reason is because what David describes here is what life is actually like. Um, things go wrong. Now, sometimes you feel we can be a little bit unrealistic about our Christian experience. And sometimes we can talk as though um, you have one moment of decision when you become a Christian and instantly everything is different. Everything has changed. Now, most people, our experience is not like that. There are a few. There are some people who in the moment of becoming Christians, there's a radical instant transformation in their lives. But even those people, I think, would say to you when they're being honest that even though God has done so much for them in that moment, there still come uh, trials and difficulties and temptations. Uh, and life is, is never really just squared away neatly. So the, the kind of very uh, straightforward story that we would like, where just God comes, we're saved, and that's it, that's the end of it. Uh, that wasn't David's experience in this psalm. It's not my experience, and I suspect it's not your experience. Now, I think this is what life is always like. You know, we solve one problem, three more come along. Uh, and it's no good waiting until we've sort of cleared our desk before we go on to do big important things and sort of waiting for the perfect moment to do big projects because there are always more things coming along, always more problems. Uh, and what I want to say to you is that this is just a fact about life and about living in this world. It's not a failure. It's not an indication that our Christian lives are, are a failure. Um, that's just what it's like. It's how things are. So let's look at some of the things that can bring us down. Uh, in David's case, uh, I'll read you from uh, verses 11 to 14. He says, Let your unfailing love and faithfulness always protect me, for troubles surround me, too many to count. My sins pile up so high I can't see my way out. They outnumber the hairs on my head. I've lost all courage. Lord, please rescue me. Come quickly, Lord, and help me. May those who try to destroy me be humiliated and put to shame. Now, there are lots of things going on here, aren't there? Uh, part of what David sees here is just circumstances when he says troubles surround me. Now, who knows what that was? That could have been just matters of, of trying to administrate a kingdom and, uh, or something to do with uh, the logistics or, or money. Or he also talks about those who try to destroy me. So another source of problems for us, apart from just circumstances, is, is people. We may as well be honest about it. People are, are, are wonderful, but they're not always the most straightforward things to deal with. People can be very difficult. Either in David's case, where he's talking about actual enemies, which hopefully we don't really have a lot of enemies now. It's not like it was 
so much in David's time, but even still, you know, people who, who perhaps love us, but are still irritating. Okay, I think you all know what that feels like. And of course, the third thing that David highlights that, that is also a snare to him, that also brings him down, is his own sin. He says, my sins pile up so high, I can't see my way out. And this as well, I think, is, is a, well, I was going to say a very common experience, but I'll go further. I'll say it's universal for Christians, that we think we're going along well, and we find our own sin trips us up. We're not as perfect as we thought. We're not as far along the path of becoming like God as we thought. We think about all the things that uh, Paul writes we should be in Galatians 5 when he talks about how we should have love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. And often we look at ourselves and we don't measure up to that. Now all these things will come. Circumstances will make life difficult for us. Other people will introduce complications. Our own failings will make everything worse so what's the way through uh, and this is where we want to come back to the, the center of this psalm the middle piece really where David I think has the key insight that transformed the way he thought about all of this and I think is what made him um, that man after God's own heart that phrase that we've talked about several times in this series here's what he says in verses six and seven you take no delight in sacrifices or offerings. Now that you have made me listen, I finally understand you don't require burnt offerings or sin offerings. And then I said, look, I have come. There's a lot in there. Now in the Old Testament era, people tried to make themselves right with God by sacrificing animals, by bringing them to the altar, the animal would be slain and that was a sacrifice. Where, which is what people used to show that they were serious about wanting to atone for their sins. But David has this striking insight, although he's an Old Testament man, living 500, times before, uh, 500 years before the time of Christ, he has this insight that these sacrifices are not required. Now that's quite an amazing thing for someone living at that time. Now we can look at this and we understand why not. If we're Christians, we understand why not. Let me read to you from chapter 10 of the letters to the Hebrews. Uh, I'm going to start in verse 11. And this is what David somehow saw, although he wouldn't have been able to explain it probably. Here's what it says. Under the old covenant, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never take away sins. But our high priest, that's Jesus, offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. And then he sat down in the place of honour at God's right hand. For by that one offering, he forever made perfect those who were being made holy. It's the most extraordinary transformation. One sacrifice is required, and that is not required of us. It was required and has been paid by Jesus 2,000 years ago. So how was David able to see that 500 years before the time of Christ? In a time that was dominated by law uh, and where revenge and anger were commonplace. How was he able to see it? Well, I think there's a clue in this very passage uh, that we just read. Uh, let me read it to you again. He says, you take no delight in sacrifices or offerings now that you have made me listen I finally understand you don't require burnt offerings or sin offerings. So I think it's simply this, or this is a big part of it, that David listened and that he took the time to hear what God was saying and to understand the impressions that God was giving him. And this links right back, doesn't it, to the beginning of the psalm. Do you remember the opening words? I waited patiently for the Lord. Now that's a matter of taking time. It isn't just a matter of, um, you know, I read my Bible notes this morning and, and then moved on. It's, um, David was spending time. He was giving time. And because of that, I believe, he was able to hear and understand what God was saying to him. Now, in saying that, I don't want to disrespect um, pre-made Bible notes and little meditations and things that can be really helpful for people uh, as they um, put time aside to spend with God. 
often in the mornings. Um, but I feel that often it's much better to, instead of maybe doing that five or six times a week for five minutes, it's probably better sometimes if we just take a, a solid chunk of time, half an hour or an hour, less often if we can't squeeze it in often, and take the time to read in detail something that's in the Bible, to think it through, to pray it through, to listen, to hear what God is saying, to understand what's in there. And I think that's what David was doing and meditating and that that's why he was able to have this extraordinary insight 500 years before Jesus came of the kind of sacrifice that he would be. So what's our response to this and what was David's response? Well, he was told he didn't need to bring sacrifices, but again, I'll read it yet again, that little section, and listen to how it ends. You take no delight in sacrifices or offerings. Now that you've made me listen, I finally understand. You don't require burnt offerings or sin offerings. Then I said, look, I have come. So what David brought to God was not a sacrifice, but himself. Or if you want to think of it another way, he himself was the sacrifice. He was bringing himself as a sacrifice. And that, of course, is what God wants from us. Not that we give him our things, not that we sacrifice animals, but that we ourselves come to him. Here's how Paul explains this in chapter 12 of the letter to the Romans. Right at the start of the chapter, he says this. Dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. Now, there are two things I want to draw out of that. The first one is this. Notice he says, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of what he has done for you. Now, that's very, very different from the Old Testament sacrifice, not just because Paul tells us to sacrifice ourselves instead of sacrificing animals, but because there people make the sacrifice to God in order to earn his favour, in order to, if you like, in order to, to get God to do things for them. But Paul's describing the exact opposite. It's saying because God has already done so much for us, because he has forgiven us, therefore our response is to bring ourselves as a sacrifice. Let me read it to you again. Dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind you will find acceptable. Now, the second thing I want to draw out of that is this, that Paul calls us living sacrifices. Now, that's, it's a contradiction, isn't it? By definition, a sacrifice is dead. Um, when the priest in David's time took a sheep to the altar, the sheep was slaughtered. And laid on the altar and that it was sacrificed it was killed uh, so what is going on here is that we are being asked in no lesser way than the sheep or the bull or whoever it was in old testament times we're being asked to sacrifice ourselves to give our lives as those animals did but to do so while still alive what an extraordinary transformation we who are alive are nevertheless sacrifices and this is why uh, occasionally if I hear an evangelist uh, preaching and might use a phrase like, uh, I want you to accept Jesus into your heart, I can slightly cringe at that because although it's well-meaning, I, th I think it misstates what is being asked of us, not to accept Jesus as uh, you know, there's a little place in here for him. He can be part of what I'm doing. But uh, another phrase evangelists use, which I think is much, much better, is to give your life to Jesus. And that's what Paul's talking about, isn't it? That you're laying down your life in response to the one who laid down his life for you. We sacrifice ourselves in response to the sacrifice that Jesus has already made for us. So what God wants from us is not our stuff, not sacrifices that we bring, but our actual selves, our lives. Now we've got some uh, songs everybody knows, I think, that uh, actually capture this really well. Uh, a German hymn, Wir Flügen und Wir Streuen, uh, was freely translated into our harvest hymn, We Plough the Fields and Scatter. And Jane Montgomery Campbell, who made that translation, actually did it very freely and added thoughts in, in the last verse that aren't in the German original. And I think it's a very good effect. So here's how that hymn ends. You may remember it. No gifts have we to offer. 
for all thy love imparts, but that which thou desirest, our humble, thankful hearts. So in other words, we're not bringing a sheep or some other thing to sacrifice. We're bringing ourselves, and that is what God looks for. Or what about this in um, uh, in the bleak midwinter, the Christmas carol? The last verse of that, again, probably be familiar to most of you. What can I give him, poor as I am? If I were a shepherd, I would bring a lamb. If I were a wise man, I would do my part. Yet what I can, I give him. Give my heart. Now, my only quibble with that as a piece of, of hymn writing is it kind of suggests that it would be better if I could bring a lamb or better if I had some gold or frankincense and myrrh. But since I don't, then I'll give God the only thing I've got to give, which is my heart. But actually, uh, the way the Bible unfolds this to us and the way Psalm 40 explains it, it's clear that that's actually the thing that God wants. Which is why David says, here I am, I've brought myself. Not a sacrifice, not gold, I've brought myself. And that is what God is looking for. Now, we've talked about how this can be a cycle. God rescues us, he lifts us out of a pit, and then later, by the end of the psalm, in David's case, uh, we need rescuing again. Doesn't God get bored of this? Doesn't he have better things to do than keep listening to us as we keep getting into trouble over and over? And I, I'm really finishing on this. I want to point out that no, of course, is the answer. In verse 5 of the same psalm, here's what David says. If I tried to recite all your wonderful deeds, I would never come to the end of them. Now, what David's saying is that God does not become exhausted. We can never use up all of his goodness. And we need to see how very much greater God is than our idea of what can be done. You know, if someone comes and asks me for help, I'm happy to help. The second person comes, I might sigh internally and go and do something. The third person, I'm really thinking, it, please, no, don't ask me to fix your computer problem or whatever it would be. God isn't like that. He isn't finite. He doesn't run out of energy. He doesn't get bored. He's always ready. And that's why even as king, David needed to return again and again to God. Listen to this from right near the end. Remember, this is King David writing this. Not David as a little shepherd boy. This is David when he was king. He says this. As for me, since I am poor and needy, let the Lord keep me in his thoughts. You are my helper and my saviour. Now, David, who was king, the most powerful man in the nation, and at the time when it was a very successful and prosperous nation, saw himself as poor and needy in relation to the greatness of God. Why? Not because he was confused about his own status as king, but because he recognised how very much greater and higher and more powerful God is. He recognised that even he, as king, needed to return to the infinite God who is never exhausted to come to him again and again and again. And what David did, we need to do to keep returning to God for fresh strength when we're weak, for fresh forgiveness after we've let him down, for fresh joy, the joy of knowing him and of knowing forgiveness and of confidence and of certainty in the future that he has for us. All of that comes from seeking God himself, from bringing not sacrifices, but bringing ourselves. So like David, with everything that he went through, what we need to do is just keep returning to the God who never tires of us, who lifts us out of a pit of despair today, but will then lift us out of another pit tomorrow and the day after and for as long as it takes. The God who does not want us to bring sacrifices, but to bring ourselves to bring ourselves to him and that's what he wants and that's what's best for us. <laughs>